This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. Hello guys and welcome to another episode of the Stardom Cast, your sort of weekly audio source of all things world-wondering stardom right here on the Podmania Podcasting Network. I'm your host, Rob Goodwin, and I am joined as ever by the mouth of Scotland himself, Chris O'Brien. Chris, how are you, buddy? Yes, sir. I can be here. (laughs) I need a certain song. (laughs) But I can boogie, 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 all night long. Is that it, or are you going to carry on? I mean, I'm not going to do the whole fucking song. Uh, that genuinely thought, I was going to leave you and see how long you would carry on, just out of awkwardness. <laughs> um, but it was nice to see that trending yesterday on Twitter. I don't know if you saw. Um, I don't look at trending on Twitter. It's always like people I've never heard of getting into arguments it's either that or you will see a name and automatically assume shit if they died and you're like oh yeah every every time i see a name and trending on twitter it's like oh for fuck's sake tell me stephen fry hasn't died exactly bruce forsyth starts trending on twitter i remember that a couple of years ago um and i was like please don't die he hadn't thankfully it was something inane like he bought a coffee or something um but yeah it yeah um i thought it was nice that that was trending especially because it was the only nice thing that happened to scotland yesterday can Ooh. I just say? Can I just say? First of all, shut your whole mouth, Goodwin. <laughs> Second of all, bell kids, I'll fucking nut you. Fucking calling me, out. tagging every Scottish person you fucking know on Twitter, saying "ha." Fuck you. Fuck you. Okay. We're still gonna we're still gonna kick your asses on fucking Friday. <laughs> Are you talking to me or Velkage now? Oh no, not not oh. Velkid. Oh, the English. We can all agree with the English have the enemy to everyone. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, fuck you all. Yeah, fuck us all. Um, I mean... Yeah, all English are bastards. I find it hard to disagree with that, um, being part bastard myself. So, you know, there we are. Um, I mean, before you start shouting everyone down, um, in terms of the Scotland-Czech Republic game yesterday, did you actually watch it? Oh, no, I don't give a fuck about football. Then you can't then call people out on the podcast. I, if he hadn't have tweeted me, I wouldn't be calling him out. As it, as it sounds, I'll fucking nut him. <laughs> Love you, Valkage. Um, anyway, so it's been a long time since we've done a stardom cast, or it feels like it. Um, and we've got a lot to talk about today. Um, we've got a, lot, a little bit of news. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Corican show. And obviously the main reason we are all here um, to talk about the re-debut of Arisa. No, to talk about the Tokyo Dream Cinderella show from the 12th of January. Um, I mean, the Arisa thing was better, but okay. Where what? The Arisa thing was better, but okay. <laughs> of course it was, you massive Arisa mark. She's better than your favourite. Let's agree to disagree, shall we? I mean, like, you, 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 we can, but like we both know you're wrong. You just haven't seen... Uh, yeah, yeah. This was when something they... you said before we came on on air. We just agree to disagree because you're always right. I just haven't always seen it yet. Yep. Happened with New Japan. Basically, just happened with New Japan. You don't, you, you don't enlighten yourself very much. You're not overly woke. So I'm not overly woke. Are you saying <laughs> that you are woke, Chris? Woke I, Brian? I, I I am a fucking, I am a fucking philosopher when it comes to wrestling. <laughs> I am a wise man. <laughs> You are wrestling Jesus, is what you're saying. I am wrestling Jesus, yes. So, effectively, ladies and gentlemen, within the first, while we are, about four and a half minutes of the podcast, Chris has labelled himself the wrestling Moses, who is going to lead the unwashed wrestling masses towards wrestling Nirvana, is what you are saying. No, but like nine out of ten people listening to this podcast already have some pretty based opinions. I'm leading the unwashed Rob to <laughs> see for light. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I I need to watch more two AW. You also need to wash more. 
I do need to wash more. That is just that's just common knowledge, so I'm afraid. Um yeah. anyway, you let's <laughs> let's kick into uh let's kick into some sad news before my self esteem hits complete rock bottom. Um it's all right, we have another podcast to do after this and all. We do, we've got so much recording to do. <laughs> you, got me for, you got me for two rounds, fucker. <laughs> oh, I think I talk to you more than I talk to my actual girlfriend who I live with. I think I spent more time talking over Discord to you. That's that's quite a sad state of affairs, I think. Meh. Yeah. I, I, who am I going to talk to? My mum. <laughs> it's just made great. it worse. <laughs> Um, first things first, we have got a couple of injuries uh, to very briefly talk about. It was announced on um, the Stardom Twitter page that both Himika and Natsupoi are going to be missing the next month or so. Um, I can't find any information regarding the Natsupoi injury. However, the Stardom um, actual actual stardom page um has said that himika is scheduled to be out for between one and two months with an issue with discs in her back um now obviously himika missed the road to um tokyo dream cinderella uh, missed i think four or five dates leading up to that um with this information it certainly makes you think how fit himika was in preparation for her match on Saturday, doesn't it? Um, yeah, sucks, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, I feel like we get a fresh injury every week now. Mm, I mean, a back injury curse, is, we got, is think, one of the worst think, to have as a wrestler. I'd say it's cursed, but Sardin's been going longer and longer. So. Yeah, I mean. I think she was probably just brought back to do the job um, for Sire. Um, I think this was probably always scheduled. The reason I've brought this up, obviously, aside from wishing both Himika and Natsupoi the very best, um, is because on the actual show, and you know, we are sort of um, diving in and out of things, but on the actual um, Tokyo Dream Cinderella 2021 show, we had an announcement for the five-star Grand Prix 2021. Um, It's going to start on the 31st of July at Yokohama Budokan. It's going to end on September 25th at Ota Ward City Gym. Um, We have got 20 competitors. Now, obviously, July 31st, is, as we're recording now on the 15th of June, is about a month and a half away. Um, Assuming the best, Himika will be fit for that, and that's fine. Um, Assuming the worst, that's Himika down. Um, And possibly Natsupoi. I can't find any sort of timescale for Natsupoi's return. Um, Chris, they've extended the field to 20 competitors, and we were talking a little bit online uh, sorry, before the podcast online about... We always talk online. <laughs> we always do. Um, about who is going to make up those spots and who is going to miss out um, in regard to basically last year. Um, so at the moment, of the 16 competitors from the 2020 um, Five Star, Jungle Kiona is the only one who is going to miss the tournament because I think July 31st is a little bit too soon for her um, sort of return for when she's supposed to be returned. I think she, I think the initial date was September. We thought she might be back as the earliest. We thought she might be back. So I think not only is July a little bit early, but also throwing her into a five-star, having just come back from the severity of the injury she's come back from, I think that might be a bit much. Um, obviously... Saki Kashima wasn't in this tournament. Um, she was replaced by Sayarida, wasn't she? Um, so, but Saki will obviously come in, you know, injury, sort of, we hope. Um, but Sayarida won't be fit for that. So, looking at who is left, we need five competitors. Um, who are those five competitors, Chris? I mean, you said before we came on, Mina and Yanagi are shoe ins. Um, <laughs> I don't assume Himika is fit. 
assume Himmaker is fit, that's fine. So would you put Natsupoy in there? Yeah, he would be a good dynamic. Um, we also have um, Koguma. Obviously, so, yeah. That, that, that's five, isn't it? No, it's four. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah. So, hmm. Hmm. I mean, do you put Lady C in as a pin eater in one of the blocks? Nick Gage. Nick Gage. <laughs> Him and his light tubes. I know how much you love light tubes. Um, um, I mean, do you... Rin? New Jack? Maybe Rin Karakura? Um, I'm trying to think with any freelancers. May... July, there's a possibility they could start bringing people in. Are you thinking Gaijin's? Mm-hmm. So Jamie Hater or a session moth or something like that. Jamie Hater would be cool. Session moth would be fun. Um, because it's not like we have much of a British scene to leave behind. That's um, true. maybe Australia or New Zealand. I don't know anything like Charlie Evans, but she's mostly with Sendai, isn't she? Um, Jessica Troy from PWA. She's good. Yeah, Layla Hirsch is signed with AEW, isn't she now? Yeah, didn't stop Rio. Um, and we haven't we haven't heard anything about Natsu in so long. No, I mean I'm assuming she's still injured. Um, I mean if she was to come back, I suppose she she would potentially fill that fifth spot. Um, unless they just go for someone like Hannon, maybe. Um, Hannon wouldn't be the worst. Maybe the few Lady C in there. I think I. I think if if Himika and Natsupoy are fit, then I think we're going to end up seeing either Lady C or Hannon. And the only reason that I say that I think it would be Hannon over Lady C is because I could see Hannon getting a surprise win and not Lady C. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it would basically be the same um, arc as Saeeda last year. Yeah, maybe just get like one set of two points, surprise someone to spoil the block, something like that. Um, I must admit, I I cannot. There's two schools of thought for me, and obviously we'll get into the five star um, a little bit later, and then obviously in podcasts um, later on down the line. But at this point, there's only really one winner of the five star for me. And that's Julia. I can't see who else wins it. Um, Unagi. You think? Well, to be fair, they are pushing her. Um, yeah. I just, I mean, talking about credible challenges to Utami, we've run through quite a few of them, and short of maybe a Mayu rematch, I can't really see who else is going to be. I can't really see who's going to take the belt off you, Tommy, if it's not Julia. Well, saying that, I did Mo- say that about Mayu. Momo could complete for somewhat of an arc they had last year and would also stop people asking us about Momo. <laughs> Why is Momo being buried? Well, I imagine those people are very, very annoyed at the fact that Momo is the only member of Queen's Quest that's not in the opening graphics package for yeah. Star World. She, she thinks she think <laughs> if, if I was Momo, i just win because I'm not a loser. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that, and obviously um, we'll be warming up towards that after um, after Yokohama Dream Cinderella in summer, um, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, but, Chris, I know that you will want to talk about this, and I know this is why you're a bit grumpy today. Um, Arisa made her re-debut, sort of, um, after it was, injury. It was an acting performance, Robert. She didn't wrestle. It was an acting performance. We went out of her way to say it was acting. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people use the word acting uh, in relation to it. I haven't seen it. I know they've recently uploaded it to uh, to YouTube so you can watch it, but I haven't. I haven't seen. It. I know you have. Um, yes. What was it like seeing Arisa again? Um, I cried. I, I was crying anyway. It kind of just gave me a reason to cry. Um. It, she's obviously not hitting as hard as she did when she was in stardom because you know her neck is full of goblins yeah like she's essentially held together by duct tape and prayers yeah she still bumped well that surprised me I didn't expect her to bump at all but she bumped like not 
like bump, like not like crazy on your head, kibashi shit, but still bumped. Still enough to think, bloody hell, should she be doing that? Yeah, some nice kicks. One of them was a pirate or something. It was overall good. I was just happy to see Orisa again, to be honest. Mm. It was at like, Res Girls, wasn't it? It was at Res Girls, at, at Res Girls yeah. Um, which I've watched half an event of, and it's okay. But Greg, um, Gregor of Gregor's at Res Arc, which I came up with a name of, waiting for the royalties body. Um, <laughs> but he um, he started singing at Res Girls podcast. So if you want to, if you want to know about at Res Girls, go. Go listen to that. I know nothing about them. <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about our res girls. It's, it's act what it's act Yakizawa's promotion after Yoshiko caved her in. Yeah, beat the piss out of her. Um, fair enough. Um, I, to be honest, it's just it's nice to see Arisa back in the ring. It's a shame it's not for Stardom, but obviously I, that's never going to happen again. Um, due to the fact that you know she's broken, um, which is a shame, but. There we are. I'm glad she's back in the ring. You always got the impression that she wanted to be in the ring, so it's nice that she's able to do it in some capacity, even if it is, in inverted commas, a performance. Also, 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 um, still trying to get Unlimited Dream Navigator over. Still trying to get Unlimited Dream Navigator. Did she come out to one of their songs? Um, Sounded like her singing, and she had her their logo on her coat. Did she? Yeah, it's not as bad as Fozzy uh, as Jericho. We got a Fozzy tattoo. Has Jericho got a Fozzy tattoo? Yeah, you know that weird skull. That's the logo off of the Fozzy album. Is it really? Yeah. Fucking hell! What knacker? Jesus Christ! It looked much better now that it's like a sleeve. Yeah, but when it, it was, does look better now that, it's a sleeve. It was in a weird place, and all it wasn't like on his on like the top of his arm. It was like just above the elbow, which is a weird place to have a tattoo. Like, like if it's your only tattoo, it's a weird place to have a tattoo. Yeah, you either have it on the side of your arm at the top by your shoulder, or you have it on your foot, like on the inside of your forearm. Yeah, or like on your calf if you're a bad bitch, or a tramp stamp if you're a if you're the type bitch. Of per- <laughs> no, it, it, or a tramp stamp if you're the type of person who has their own album. Loco tattooed onto them. I still can't get over the fact that Lance Archie used to have a tramp stamp. I still can't. I still can't get over the fact that AJ Styles has his own name tattooed on him in big letters. I still can't get over that one of the one of his fans had the exact same tattoo put That's on him. So I know it's so creepy, isn't it? That's the worst thing. It is the oh, worst oh. thing. Like, it's not even, like, an homage. It's just that... And, like, the dates underneath are when his children were born. That's so... Cre- like, at the very... Like, he even had the little love heart that he put next to his daughter's one. At the very fucking least, you could put, like, dates he won for the Championship or something. Don't copy the dates his children were born. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was... It was... It's really weird. And he was so fucking proud of it as well. Yeah. Imagine if, like, going to, like access or something and meeting styles is like hey i really liked your match with john cena also look at this <laughs> look at this <laughs> oh my god put it away it'd be it'd be some shit if you got it on the wrong side of his body the guy with the winged eagle belt tattooed across his belly has more credibility than that guy yeah why would you get such an ugly ass belt on your belly behave stop being controversial anyway <laughs> <laughs> not for this podcast don't buy a fucking long shot um let's move into some results so we i want to start with we're not going to go through um all three shows that led up to tokyo dream cinderella um we're just going to sort of cherry pick little moments um, the first moment is from the show in Nagata from the 5th of June. Um, it happened in front of 119 people and genuinely just looked like a school hall. It was a re- It's the first time I've ever seen, um, and again, I apologize if I'm butchering this name, Joetsu, Joetsu Tourism and Product Center. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen that arena and it literally just looked like our school hall. Um, it was very weird, but it's in front of 119 people. Um, and it was Kaguma's return match. Um, and yeah, quite honestly, Chris, um, aside from, for some strange reason, them overdubbing her music, which didn't really make a lot of sense. Um, they just overdubbed it with an electric guitar version of Mayu's. Um, there wasn't a lot to write home about. Bless her. She looked 
terrified. And obviously, you know, she's been out of the ring for six years. Um, and, you know, during a pre-match promo, you know, she was really quiet. She was really timid. You could you could feel the nerves. Um, and especially in the initial exchanges with Lady C, you could tell that she was very nervous. She grew into the match, don't get me wrong, um, and she won it with the Kaguma Cutter and um, basically a stack-up, basically. Um, but... Yeah, overall it was uh, it was an underwhelming re-debut. But again, having had six years out of the ring, not botch, you know, there's obviously going to be ring rust there. So you know, we're not going to be too uh, we're not going to be too harsh on Kaguma. But I just wanted to bring uh, that up—the fact that this was her re-debut show. Um, I know you didn't watch it, Chris, so I'm not going to ask for your opinion. You, you, you didn't have to call me out like that, man. <laughs> um, other results on the show: um, Saki Kashima uh, rede- uh, sorry, came back after injury. She defeated Micah and Mina Shira Kaur in eight minutes. Um, there was a tag team match which ended in our old favorite time limit draw with Tam and Yunagi. We set the clock. It's been zero podcast <laughs> since our last ti- meaningless time limit draw. Um, Tam and Yunagi drawing with Azumi and Saya Kamatani. Apparently, we need to keep Yunagi strong. Um, tag team match then. MK Sisters defeated Momo Watanabe and Yutami. Damn it, they're burying Momo. And then the main event was a six woman tag Donna Del Mondo, Julia Natsupoy, and Suri defeating Oedatai, Konami, Natsukatora, and Ruaka. Um, rather than go through um, the Asha. I can never say this. Asa High Broadcasting Stardom Terrestrial Broadcasting Memorial Show from Kanazawa. I'm just going to jump straight into uh, the Corican show just because not a lot happened on the uh, on the Kanazawa well. show. It was basically a Road 2 show. So we'll kick straight into the latest Corican show, um, the Road to Tokyo Dream Cinderella Special Edition from the 8th of June 2021 in front of 497 people. Now... This show obviously happened four days prior to a pay-per-view, so it was never going to be must-see viewing because, you know, it's effectively an advert for the big pay-per-view show that they were doing. So there was only one title match. It was a high-speed um, title match between Natsupoi and Fukukin Death, which we'll be getting into in a moment, and we had the some more of the initial rounds for the Future of Stardom title tournament. Um, but aside from that, apart from a few little story beats here and there, there wasn't a lot that you will have missed if you did indeed miss this. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of the results, Chris. Um, if you want to chip in at any point, Chris, just let me know. Just interrupt me. Otherwise, I'll just fire through them. Um, so match one saw the Future of Stardom title first round match with Hina defeating Rina at 5.43 with the Gato Clutch. It was fine. You know, it's... <laughs> once you've seen one Hina versus Rina match, you tend to have seen them all. Um, the only thing I will say um, is that Hina was hitting with a lot more aggression than I've seen in a while. Um, and also, it's gl- it's nice to see Hina get the win. Um, she seems to be forgotten quite a lot. Um sort of in the shadows of Hannon and especially Rena in recent months. So it's nice to see her get the win um, and progress in the tournament. It was a decent enough match. I gave it two and a quarter stars. Um, but again, like I said, if you've seen one match, you've seen them all. We moved on then to match two, which was the Future of Stardom semi-final match, which saw Yunagi defeat Hannon at 8.53. Now, this match is notable uh, because it was the debut of Unagi's new finish, Chris. Hmm. Have you seen it? If I have, I I don't remember. (laughs) It's... Right, so basically, Stardom World labelled it. (laughs) It's called, It Was a Good Idea. That's genuinely what Stardom World called it. Um, I, again... Dragon Moon on Twitter, phenomenal work. Um, they've said that actually it's called, and again, I apologize if I butcher this, um, Taiji Da'ata, which apparently translates as thank you for your service, and uh, she's learned it from Milano Collection AT. Basically, what it is, is it's a variant of the Made in Japan that Shingo does, 
Um, apart from the fact that it's just a little bit more convoluted. She sort of gets... So Hannon was facing away from her, and she sort of hooked the arms, then turned around into like a suplex position, and then hit the Made in Japan. It looked cool, and, you know, it wasn't botched. It ju- it just seemed a little bit convoluted to get into. Um, but we have... I know both me and you have been crying out for something different in Yunagi's offense um, because, you know, she can't go through the next couple of years with her finishing move being the gory special. Um, so, yeah, this was fine. I'm a little bit disappointed that Hannon didn't get the victory just because, you know, I really like Hannon. Um, but obviously with the push they're giving Yunagi at the moment, I think it was a foregone conclusion who the final would be. Um, speaking of which, um, the second semi final was next. Uh, with Mina Shirakawa defeating Hina in 7 minutes and 50, with a Luthez press. Of all the things to finish off Hina, it was a Luthez press. Um, hey man, no one complained when Jumbo did it. <laughs> yeah, it's she's not Jumbo though. Um, so you, yeah. You can't prove that. <laughs> that is true, she could be the reincarnation. That is a very good point. Um, yeah, again, absolutely nothing to talk about here. It was It was a match, it was there. I was disappointed that Mina finished Hina off with such a lackluster move, but there we are. There we are. Mina, at the moment, like we, we talked, Chris, about how we were impressed with how hard-hitting Mina was being and how much of a progression we've seen in that. And also how much, you know, I know a big thing for you was the um, the spinning forearm. Um, and the fact she slapped her leg when she didn't, she stopped doing that. She seems to be more of a bruiser. And then just, just ever so... Just ever, Ever so recently, she seems to just be in sort of comedy. I don't know if you've noticed that. It might just be me, and, you know, it might not bother anyone else, but I am I am noticing that we just seem to be getting into a bit of comedy with Mina about how, you know, she's the idol, and, you know, look at me posing in the middle of the ring and stuff like that. And uh, We'll get on to that when we get the tag, to the tag match, I think. Yeah, the tag match, it's it's really obvious, but I'm not too bothered about it in the tag match because the tag match was there as comic fodder, basically. Uh, they made that abundantly clear. So going well more into comedy matches, they're burying her. <laughs> but yeah, just I don't mind if it's if it's inherently a comedy match. And I might just be a grumpy fuck, but even You're always so. Always a grumpy fuck. I'm a gr- No. Don't rise to it. Don't rise to it. Don't rise to it. Um, we then had a four-way oh, match. <laughs> um, Tam Nakano defeating Lady C, Azumi, and Momo Watanabe at four, uh, five minutes and 43 seconds with the German suplex. Um, we then had our one and only title match of the show. Um, Natsupoi defeating Fukuken Death to uh, retain her high-speed title in her second defense at six minutes and 30 seconds with the Ferial Gift, um, which is basically her rounding body press. Um this was fine. Um, and now that I know that the chances are that Nat's point was working with an injury, it does explain a lot um, because it lacked a little. And I know it's hard to have that pizzazz when you're working with Fukukin death um, or insolent death as my phone kept trying to change it to. Um, I know it's difficult to have like a, you know, a full blown, you know, high speed match with someone like Fukukin, especially when she's in this incarnation. Um, but it did lack something this match. Um, it really did. Um, there was a couple of interesting points. There was one moment where Fukuken Death pretended to smoke a cigarette, and that's probably st- stole it off her and stamped on it. And that's unfortunately that's pretty much the only bit that I remember of the match. Smoking's bad, kids. Exactly. Don't trust the sad clown. Um, but yeah, it it was there. It's a, it's a title defense. Um, Hopefully, Starlight Kid is the next one in line. Fingers crossed. Moonlight Kid. Moonlight Kid. I gave it two and three quarter stars. Um, but yeah, I, of the high speed tile defenses, I would I wouldn't go out of your way to see this one. Um, Semi main then saw six woman tag stars team of Kaguma, Mayu Iwatani, and Starlight Kid defeat the Oida Tai team of Natsukatora, Ruaka, and Saki Kashima. Now. 
this this match is notable for a couple of things, but unfortunately, none of them are actually in the match. It's all the post-match stuff. The only thing that I would say about the actual match itself is there was a lot of focus on Starlight Kid. And obviously, if you've seen the pay-per-view, you know why that is. Um, but yeah, a lot of focus on Starlight. Starlight was built really, really well here and was the one that got the pin on Ruaka with the moonsault. After the match, both teams reveal who their ex or their mystery partner is going to be um, in terms to in regard to the pay per view. It was a five on five woman elimination uh, match. Both teams only had four women. Um, I saw a lot of hype online that it was going to be Jungle. No, um, Stars revealed it to be Rin Karakora from Marvelous. Um, and rather anticlimactically, a Tai revealed their ex to be Saki Kashima, who had just been in the match. So, yeah, that was a bit of an anticlimax. Um, Chris, are you a fan of them having revealed the identities of X before the pay per view? Or I mean, would you have rather just, just have a big surprise be, hey, Saki? <laughs> you do raise a very, very, very good point. Um, I, I don't know. It just. It, Especially with it being four days beforehand, it just seemed a little bit... I mean... Honestly, I have a feeling we just forgot to put Saki in the match graphics and we had to book an angle around it. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I don't know. I just feel like there wasn't there wasn't enough of a payoff for either... And this is no disrespect to Saki or Rin. Both are really, really good in ring. Um, but I feel like there wasn't enough of a payoff to even... Ha- I mean... Would you have felt any different, Chris, if it had been announced initially that Rin and Saki were in the match? W- would that have made it any different whatsoever? Did you gain anything else from them being mystery opponents? Um, I got to say X a lot. Yeah, just the build-up would have been, you know, if it was someone interesting. Basically, it was a bit of a wet fart, is what I'm saying. Start, start them having a weird build up. No, no way. It <laughs> hasn't happened at any of our big shows this year, not at all. Um, they totally just didn't throw a random rumble in their build up for Budokan. To be fair, that made sense a little bit. It wasn't very Did good. It, it wasn't Did very it, good. No rumbles are good. Rumbles are just shit. It didn't. Look, it was an excuse to get a load of old talent on the show. I don't mind that. No, I'm talking about the Rumble that was randomly on the build-up. Oh, the one that Ruaka won. Uh, won. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. I thought you were talking about the one in Budokan. I was like, why you see, would... the fact that you can't tell what fucking Rumble I'm talking about tells you how much they're abusing the concept of a Rumble. They've done it twice. That, that's more than... That's too more than we sh- really should. Stop being a grumpy bastard. Honestly. Um... And then the other thing that came out of this post-match build-up was um, basically Starlight Kid coming out and saying, what are the rules then for this match on the pay-per-view? And Nats Katora going, why do we the tie have to do everything? Can't you come up with some rules? Then she clearly remembered the stupid rules that Mayu came up with last time and went, actually, don't worry about it. We'll come up with the rules. Um, and basically came out with, it's just going to be the same rules as last time. So the loser of that match, the last loser on whichever team, um, would join the opposing unit. What uh, the fuck were they going to do if they wins for one who got pinned? Well, that is true. That is true. <laughs> Contracted to start them. <laughs> um, when you realise, Chris, that this was going to be the stipulation, and we'll keep who turned, um, who ended up on an opposing unit secret just for a while, even though if you're listening to this, you've probably seen the show. You've um, already, already, already said to it. No, I haven't. We definitely have. Did you think that that was going to be the way that they were going, or did you think that they were just going to be playing Fukig and Death Tennis? I, I honestly assumed it was going to be Fuki and... Because uh, I, I thought initially it was to keep Death's name. Well, I thought that's what it was initially. That's why I got like, really no, confused. And then it was like, who the fuck's buying tickets to see Death keep her name? <laughs> it's just Fuki and Death on a pole match. Um, that sounds terrifying. It like, does a little like, bit. Imagine walking into an arena and seeing a clown hanging from the rafters. A sad one as well. Smoking. Yeah. Oh, awful. <laughs> it would be like it's like the clown from Toy Story Three. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that would be terrifying. Um but yeah, apparently that was completely He's become French. <laughs> um yeah, the initial stipulation was apparently completely ignored. Um it might well have been um canned in one of the road two shows that we didn't see, but it wasn't even referenced in this post match. Um so yeah, whoever lost, 
whoever was the final survivor on the losing team, they would be the one to go to the opposing unit. Um, and then match seven, the main event, uh, was a really, really good match. It's actually the only match that I would urge you to go and watch on this show. Um, it was another six-woman tag. Donna Del Mondo, Julia Micah, and Suri defeating the Queen's Quest team of Momo, Saya, and Utami, um, with Micah pinning Momo with the oh, Michinoku no, Momo. Driver 2. <laughs> Momo well, was being buried. Exactly. Um, yeah, it was a really, really good match. Um, this is where Julia suggests the shuffle tag as opposed to um, just a conventional three-way tag. She says it's boring. Uh, Rossi agrees because Julia is apparently head booker of stardom. Um, <laughs> Why do you think she main evented the last <laughs> Over yeah. the red belt. Yeah. Still can't get over that. Um Micah then taunts. Saya says she's not worthy, uh, adding another wrinkle to their feud. And Utami debuts this incredibly cool golden gear, um, which then doesn't wear at um, at O Towards City Gym, which I'm really disappointed about because she looked... Every time I see her, she just looks more and more like a champion. And it's, it's so cool how much she's grown since she got that belt in November, it just she's grown so much into the role of champion. Um, there wasn't a lot added here to the Suri and Utami feud. It was mainly just Suri saying, basically, I'm going to beat you and be shrouded in vermilion fire, which is quite a cool thing to say, but it doesn't add anything to the feud. So basically, just to round it all off, um, go and watch the main event. It's a really, really, really good match. I gave it four stars. So yeah, go and check that out. However, the main event of the podcast, obviously, was the pay-per-view, which was Stardom Tokyo Dream Cinderella Special Edition, which was initially um, suspended by the venue because of the uh, state of emergency in Tokyo, and therefore was moved to the 12th of June. Same venue, in front of 1,240 people. Um... First things first, Chris, um, just about the venue. I think the venue looked beautiful. And with the um, hangings on either side of the entranceway, I got proper G1 Climax vibes. And I can't remember what venue it is where they have the G1 Climax sort of graphics down the side as banners. But it looks really, really cool. It reminds me of like G1 23 and 24 and 25. Can you remember what venue it is? Do you know which one I'm even talking about? No. no. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It doesn't matter then. But if you're if you're listening to this podcast, there is there's one set of G1 venues where there's hangings down the side, and it just looks really regal. And I thought they did a very very good job of that here. It looked it looked really really cool the venue the way they did it up. Um. Again, Chris. And I know you're going to feel the same because you've got a proper down on today. I felt like once again on this pay-per-view and in the immediate aftermath of this pay-per-view, Stardom felt huge. They've done a really, really good job of making the, the company feel huge. huge. The, production the production felt production, really good. This is probably the best production on any Stardom show this year. Yeah, there was just there was little change. Like the camera work felt a lot better. Like, and like there was, was like a crane camera going on. It's really cool. That's what I meant. Yeah, there was a lot. I just Tyra. felt like it. It felt like, massive. We we'll get, we'll get to it in the main event, but Tammy's never felt more like a um, champion than she did in that entrance. Her and Suri both entered and looked. It, it felt like a real pay per view main event. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, we'll get into that in a um, in a moment. But Suri's entrance gear, man, that that coat is what all other robes aspire to be. Um, did you watch the English commentary, Chris, or did you watch the Japanese commentary? I watched English. I wanted to see how it would go. Okay. And overall, how do you think Stuart and Sonny did in their first stardom event ever to feature English commentary? I'm sure Fulton is a really good um, play-by-play, I want to say, but like he's a very good like main commentator. He's very enthusiastic. He does his research. Yep. Um, and also, like, I'm honestly just happy to do a Scottish voice and... <laughs> <laughs> on commentary. Well, I know you watch a lot of Noah, and so you're familiar, sort of familiar with him from yeah, there. He, so he, he does Noah. He does TJPW as well. Um, he also did Cyber Fight. He's great on Noah because he fucking has a right hard on for anymore. He's like, oh, he's a beast. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and then Sonny, look, in, in terms of people in Japan, there's probably not anyone who knows Stardom better than Sonny because, you know, he works there. Mm. But also, he's very clearly not a fucking presenter. Like, he, 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 he was lifeless. Like, which is fine, but because Stuart could kind of carry the play by play. But, like, when you think of, like, other analysts almost, like Matt Pickering for Noah or um, Chris Charlton Chris for Charlton, New Japan. Yeah. Yeah, they're both they were both much more enthusiastic than Sunny. If we're gonna use Sunny in future, we need to like get him some fucking media training. Because I'm not I'm not being funny. There's nothing worse than drab commentary, and like every time Sunny butts in, it's like, okay, cool, you're adding to the story, but oh my god, you're boring me to tears. I completely understand what you're saying. Um, especially especially the first There's... half of the show, I felt I felt that was really prevalent. There's a reason when New Japan and like obviously Sardom can't do it, but there's a reason why when New Japan got English commentary for the first time they got JR and Matt Stryker. Mm. Just for just for that uh, sort of enthusiasm. First, impre- first impressions mean a lot when it comes to if you're trying to expand into a um different market. Yeah. I will say, like I say, I agree with you. Um I think Sonny did I think Sonny grew into it. Definitely, especially, you know, those last two matches, I think he grew into it. Something that it is like you said, there's gonna be very, very few people, you know, who are yeah. whose English is for their first yeah. language that know the company as well as Sonny. He and... had a he had one problem where he wouldn't like, you know, when something big happens, you meant to like stop your point and go, Whoa, he didn't do that. So like the big DDT in the um, the, some of the big counters driver in either Siren Micah or Tammy Shuri mm. didn't land as hard watching English commentary because he just kept making the point of the massive bomb that just got thrown. And I think as well, for, for me personally, I think that that's something that will come with experience. And if this is something that they're going to now have on pay-per-view, which I'm, I'm again going to ask you in a second, because I know you've got um, some thoughts on this, or I know you did. I don't know if you still do. Um, if they're going to continue to do this, I think Sonny will grow up because he's with Stuart. Because let's not forget, his points were all fine. His points were great. His contextual information that he added to the matches was brilliant. However, you could tell that the lad was nervous, as I would be. Doing wrestling commentary cannot be easy. And especially if it's the first time you've ever done it, in front of, you know, you're there in front of 1,200 people, you know that there are however many pay-per-view buys, your nerves are going to set in. And that's why you let the experienced person take the lead, which he did with Stuart. And, you know, when he did chime in, yes, it was very bland, it was very monotone, but that's, to me, that's put down to nerves. I mean, you can't take away the fact that it happened, obviously, but I think the more that they do this, if this is something that they are going to add to other pay-per-views, I think that he will grow with that. And I think the more he works with Stuart, you know, the more of a presenter style he will have. Yeah, maybe. We'll um, see. My question to you, Chris, sort of to follow up to that, um, obviously one of the big things that stopped people getting into stardom was the lack of commentary and, you know, the lack of English commentary, certainly. Um, is it something that you want to see on pay-per-view now that you've now that you've witnessed it? A big thing for you, I know, because when we first started doing this podcast was you liked the fact that they had no commentary because it left, and it was something I liked as well, actually, Um it left a lot to the watcher. It was it. It made it more subjective every match because it was up to you to take what you wanted from it. And I know English commentary sort of takes that away from you a little bit. But is it something that you'd like to see on more pay per views? Uh, it's something I understand why they have. I, I understand it because people are used to having commentary, so they want it there and they find it weird when it's not there. I get that. Mm-hmm. Um. If they're going to bring it in, I would like it for just pay-per-views. I think it would get annoying to everything because also you'd have to see commentators try and suck content out of these endless tag draws. I agree wholeheartedly um, with you. I agree with that point, definitely. I, I get it. I don't... For my own personal enjoyment, I can take it or leave it. As an experiment, it went, far, it went well. They didn't, re- they didn't really fail. As you said, I'd like I have the criticisms of Sonny's commentary, but it's his first time doing it, so he'll probably get better. But then again, we said the same thing about Rocky Romero, and he never got better. 
Um, we'll see. Like, ask me for the next one for a proper answer. It didn't fully annoy me here. And I think that's a really important thing. If something doesn't fully annoy you, then we just go with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do just want to say, well done, Stuart and Sonny, because it can't be easy um, doing what they did. So, um, Stuart Fulton's great. He, he should get he should get more gigs because he's. Well, I say more gigs. I was just going to say he does everything. He's basically covering everything that's not New Japan right now. Doesn't he do Pancrase but, as well? I think so. And Rizzy. Maybe. I'm sure he does a load of MMA as well, but... Oh, yeah. yeah, you can tell... Every time they're grappling, you can tell he's an MMA guy. He talks about grappling like his MMA is great. But he he had that enthusiasm, and I think that really yeah. helped. And we yeah, talked like, about it... it. I don't know how much stardom he watched before this, but if he hadn't seen it at all before, you couldn't tell. He's very clearly, like... He very clearly does his research before going into it, at least on the base level. Because, of course, he didn't need to do as much as Sonic, because that's not his job, but... Yeah, and I think having Sonny there will have certainly helped him because Sonny will have filled him in on all the contextual yeah. information. And maybe bringing a third guy, just while Sonny's the way he is. Yeah, well, I must admit, Sonny put on Twitter that he was nervous, and that's why I thought that's that's what it is. I mean, he's never done this before, and then he's just sort of been gone. Right, go on, have a go. So yeah, I, I can I can sort of um, I can sort of understand that. Um, but in regards to the last thing, it's the same compliment we play we paid Ian Riccoboni for the um, Hannah Kimura show. The man has like clearly done his research. Riccoboni. It's Riccoboni. I know. I don't know why Riccoboni. I keep calling him Riccoboni. It just it because... just rolls off the tongue. It's, that's probably something he got called <laughs> called to <laughs> bully him in school. Like a boner. <laughs> right. Well, that's him labelled for life. Um, but yeah, it's the same compliment we paid him, isn't it, well, from the Hannah Kimura show? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But also, cheeseburger was a better second, so he didn't notice it as much. Mm. Um, yeah, I agree with you though. It, I think if they do do English commentary, it will just be on pay-per-views. I can't see them, you know, trying to get, like you say, context out of a 100-seater Sendai show. Um, You said doo-doo. Do you know what? I knew as I said it, you were going to say something, and then you didn't interrupt me, and I was like, oh, he's let it slide. But no, no, of course, the child has to say it. Doo-doo. Fuck's sake. Um... Anyway, let's uh, let's delve into this show. So we opened with the Cinderella Tournament semi-final. Uh, Micah defeating Yunagi Sayaka at 8 minutes and 5 seconds with the Michinoku driver. Um, Chris, opinion on this match? I really enjoyed it. It's probably the best Yunagi's offense has ever looked. Um, Micah played her role really well. Like, like she, It wasn't a difficult role. It was basically a stoic person pissed off with a rookie, but it worked. Um, Unagi went off after the leg early on, which is another example of why spreading out this tournament was a bad fucking idea, because that's an element that was introduced at the start of the fucking tournament that Mike has had to fucking carry this whole fucking time. It's, like, it didn't bother me as much as I know it bothers you, but I'll let you carry on and then I'll so, say my so, And then, like, the leg, but the leg thing ended up going nowhere, which kind of makes sense, because, you know, the leg got injured two months ago. Um, fucking hell. But yeah, apart from that, it's just really solid stuff. It's probably Unagi's best singles match to date. I can't think of a better one she had. Even the Izumi one at Yokohama wasn't as good as this, I think. So yeah, really good stuff. So like, um, Micah held Unagi's hand to something worth watching. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think they did a good job of building Unagi as a credible semi finalist and a credible threat to Micah, especially early on, like you said, when she was targeting the heavily strapped left leg. I know that it irritates you that she's had to carry that through um two months or what however long it's been oh, since, she hasn't since even, April. She hasn't even she hasn't even she hasn't overly been selling the leg. Like it wasn't a factor in the Julia match, for example. No, I understand that. But, you know, she's been wrestling in the interim, so you can argue that she's re-aggravated it or something like that. It doesn't bother like, me as much. Plus, like, it's, it's, it's a not, story no, it's not, beat not, throughout this show. It's not a, It's not something that's overly... Like, it's not something that's, like, match-breaking in this case, but it's something that would have worked much better in the old format, and it's a beat very clearly designed for that old format. I don't think it suffered because of the format. Not massively, anyway. 
for me, anyway, I don't think it's suffered massively. But I can completely see your point. You know, if you're having Micah having to fight, you know, four matches on one day on one leg, then obviously it's going to be more of a story beat. But I think her having to fight this match here, um, you know, Yunagi did a little bit of work on it and then Saya fucking eviscerated it in the, in the final. Um, I think it, it was it was good enough. It, it didn't bother me. Um anywhere near as I think as it bothered you. Um I think seeing you Nagy have you know, she doesn't have the experience to win, basically, is what this boils down to. She knows to target Micah's leg, but ultimately she doesn't have the arsenal to put someone like Micah away. Not yet anyway. But she had a huge amount of passion, a huge amount of fire in her attempt to win. She's squaring up to Micah. She's not backing down, which is good. It's it's much better from you, Nagy. And I think a lot of credit has to go to Micah as well, like you said, for holding a hand. But you, Nagy, looked good. And that's not just on Micah. Um, and then any sloppiness, you know, there was there was a couple of moments of sloppiness, but I think you can tie that to Micah's leg going forward to the final. Um, what did you give this, Chris? Um, I gave it three and three quarters, but I think that's because I watched it in the morning and I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> Are you overly positive in the morning? Um, no, I'm just not as critic. I'm just not as good at critical analysis in the morning. I hadn't had my coffee yet. This basically acted as my coffee. Was I hungover? I can't remember, which probably means I was hungover. Um, yeah, I I I I regret the three and three quarter. I'd maybe go three and a half. That's exactly, three, and maybe three and a quarter. I'd have to rewatch it for a proper score. I gave it three and a quarter. Um, just because I liked the other match better. Basically, is what that um, I actually, I actually preferred this to the other match. Did you to Himika Sire? Yeah. Let's do Himika... this. Let's do that now. Then let's talk well, Himika... about that. Well, Himika Sire was good. I, I, I'll do your job for, very quickly. So next, Sire took on Himika, beating her in eight minutes and fifty-one seconds with the Star Crusher. That's what it's called, right? Yeah, it yeah, is. yeah. No, great job. Yeah, there, there we go. Your, your job's not that hard. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, Chris, what did you think? Well, I thought it was fine. Um, again, Himika was wor- was working hard. I, I, I was kind of, I kind of guessed that because there was something off as compared to their five star match, which I really enjoyed. We both really enjoyed, actually, didn't we? Um, five star match, yeah, the five star yeah. match was great. Probably one of the better matches of that tournament. Uh, but here it was just kind of fine. It was just kind of good. Saya played her role well. Himika played her role well. Some of the power bombs were really nice. Um, I thought the Star Crusher kind of came out of nowhere. But, you know, it, they had le- less than a minute to tie it up, so I guess they didn't want to risk accidentally going to a draw and just giving... <laughs> <laughs> just giving Micah the most underwhelming Cinderella victory ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, as it, as it sounds, it was kind of just good, nothing great, nothing groundbreaking, nothing overly to write home about. Um yeah, and um, if Himika was working her, that probably explains it. Mm, definitely. But because all the best parts of this move was this match with the side jumping off things. Was Sire basically bouncing around like a bouncy ball? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, something for me, and it was something I hadn't really considered until this show, is the story of redemption they're trying to build for uh, for Sire. Um, obviously, she lost at Budokan and. You know, it was a huge moment for her. And the building, like, that that basically Tam is the prize at the end of the line because, you know, Tam is the person who trained her. Um, you know, Sire is effectively Tam's protege. So to have that and have that redemption from losing the Red Belt match yeah. to winning the Cinderella, spoilers, to then going on to, you know, potentially beat Tam for the White Belt, I don't think she will, but it's a nice redemption arc that they're playing for Sire. It's a very simple one. But it's something I hadn't thought about until this match, and it, it plays quite nicely. Yeah, it, it works well. It was a it's a good beat, which I think would have been like I think it's beat that's always been there, but I think it's beat would have been more noticeable if these matches weren't two months apart. That I do agree with. That I do agree with. But I do think I that hasn't bothered me as much as I thought it would, and that's something we'll we might as well get out of the way now. No, let's just talk about it in the final. Do you want to talk about it in the final? We'll talk about it in the yeah, final. Yeah, because we'll, we'll just end up coming on back onto it into the final and we'll repeat, and we'll repeat ourselves. Okay. I enjoyed Himika's work on um, on Saya's back. 
um, t- trying to take Starcrusher out of the game, um, but basically Saya rallies. She can't hit Starcrusher initially, and then there's a great closing stretch with power bombs, Lariat, spinning wheel kicks. Eventually, and I do agree with your point here, Saya does manage to muscle Himika up for the Starcrusher, um, but ultimately it's the right decision, I think. Saya Kamatani trying to take on Micah, the woman she couldn't beat for the future of Stardom Championship, the woman who at Corican said she wasn't worthy to even be in this semi-final. I think it was the right choice to make. Yeah, yeah. What did you give it, Chris? Um, three and a quarter. I liked it. It was fine. Yeah, I, I gave it three and a half, but I figured you'd give it three and a quarter if you preferred the other one. So we're, we're about on par with the two matches. They were fine. They were They were good. Calm Interesting sprints. Film. Yeah, they were good sprints. Ooh, this match. <laughs> match, <laughs> match three then uh, was the shuffle tag um, with the teams of Julia and Natsupoi, uh, Tam and Mina and Momo and Azumi coming to the ring. Um, they then had to draw straws to find out who their teammates were. So the teams were... Um, Azumi and Natsupoi, Julia and Tam Nakano, and Mina Shirakawa and Moma. What makes me laugh is that Julia pitched this idea like we talked about at Corican, but it's interesting to note that she has history with every other woman except Natsupoi. She broke Mina's nose, she body shamed Momo, and by proxy, Azumi hates her, and she had a feud of the year going forward with Tam. So I don't exactly know what Julia's kayfabe reason was for suggesting this. She was high. She was high. Um, But obviously, as soon as they announced it was a shuffle tag and you realised who was in it, you knew Julia and Tam were going to end up together. You knew that that was going to happen. Um, I do like how how, like Mina was really enthusiastic to be with Momo and Momo wanted nothing to do with it. Genuinely, their, their chemistry was actually a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it, this, this made me really wish we could have a draft soon so we could see something <laughs> Have Momo in Cosmic Angels. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she she breaks the normal mold. Actually, no, she wouldn't get in, would she? Because she's leader, so she'd be picking. That's a shame. Um, get Mina in Queen's Quest. <laughs> get Mina in Queen's Quest. Uh, um, no. And then Azumi and Natsupoi would be the only people to be who are fine being with each other. Genuinely quite happy to be paired together. I quite like, like that. Oh, yeah. We actually have similar styles. This could work. <laughs> Minumi. Mizumi. Nizumi. Natsumi. There we go. Natsumi. Natsumi's a good one. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so aside from, obviously, the very, very strange teams, um, Azumi and Natsupoi eventually won um, with Azumi pinning Mina at 12.58 with the Azumi Sushi. What did you think of this match overall then, Chris? Did it live up to expectations? Was it what you expected it to be? Um, It, it, it was a fun little clusterfuck. So, yeah, well, what the fuck else could it be? I enjoyed the Mina stuff. Where she, it's, you know, it's like it was, it's like in Triple Threats, Adam Cole would always try to do the Adam Cole baby and then get rolled up. It was a bit like that. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Just kept trying to do it get hit and then trying to get Momo to do it and then Momo did it when she's getting hurt. I quite like that. Um Julia and Tam not being able to get along and fighting each other anyway. Cause of course they did. And then just some cool stuff. Yeah, you, you know what it was? It was basically like on day three of Bowler when you have a bunch of wrestlers who are booked but can't do anything because they're out of the tournament so they just have a random match. Yeah. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised we didn't like have the remote come out so we could slow down time. <laughs> Go full Jushin Liger. Yeah, I still can't get over that Jushin Liger's like fingering my asshole and champs just like, but you're Jushin Liger. I can't. <laughs> um, have some self respect, man. It, 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 it was fine. Um. There were little bits of it I enjoyed, like Natsupoi's conflictive about attacking Julia and then does it by accident, so Julia boots her in the face. Um, I enjoyed Mina and Momo doing the bow and arrow submission and then Tam just lying on top of Mina to try and pin her while she's doing it. I thought that was quite funny. Um, But overall, it was quite literally the definition of throwaway. Um, You know, until the very end when Tam just walks away and calls Julia shit, I thought, you know... (laughs) 
there's there's not a lot you can take from this demeanor comedy stuff if it's inherently a comedy match like i said before then i don't i don't mind it you know in here the chemistry between her and momo worked really well like mina trying to get momo to do the pose on the apron and then she finally accepts and starts just about to do it and then gets knocked off the apron that's that's fine i don't mind that um but when she's doing that you know, in every match, stopping the match, doing the pose in the middle. That I don't want that. We've seen that she can do, you know, she can put together half decent matches. That's what I want to see. Um, don't mind it in comedy spots. Don't mind it in, you know, your all-star rumbles at Budokan. Don't mind it here in this tag, which clearly does not mean anything to anyone. You know, but if she then attempts it in the future of Stardom Championship final, I am going to be annoyed because just fucking wrestle properly. But aside from me being a grouchy fuck... Um, yeah, it it was fine. It was fine. Natsupoi runs off with Azumi at the end of the match because apparently they want to tag together forever. Um, it, yeah, it it was there, Chris. What did you give it? Um, did I? I I, I forgot to rate it. <laughs> uh, you will have rated it higher than me. I guarantee. I, I think I gave it a three. Okay, you did rate it higher than me then. I gave it two and a half. Uh, just it, I don't know. It was yeah. It did make me laugh that Stuart Fulton kept saying that Julie wanted to be the center of attention. And he's like, it's hard to disagree with him, really. <laughs> um, he understands the motivation. He does. Uh, match four, then. Um, one of the advertised, you know, main events in uh, in inverted commas um, was the elimination 10-man tag team match, which we talked about before, um, with the final person eliminated made to join the opposition unit. Um, so, 10-woman tag, and Oida Tai, the team of Fukuken Death, Konami, Tora, Ruaka, and Saki Kashima, defeated the Stars team of Hanan, Kaguma, Mayu Iwatani, and Starlight Kid, and Rin Kadokura at 17 minutes and 57 seconds, with Starlight Kid the one to join Oida Tai. The match itself, Chris... I can take a leave, and we'll get oh, oh, yeah. into it properly most, in a minute. Most, yeah, most of the match, you don't give half a fuck about, but that ending, Jesus. That Like, tying ending. Starlight up to the apron. May you. While she fell to her at a time. That's some biblical fucking shit right there. Oh, my God. Just watching the emotion in Mayu's face as Tora plants Starlight Kid with two Death Valley drivers and just oh. makes oh. eye contact with her as she's doing the pinfall. It's perfect. It is drama at its highest. I text you saying it gets an extra star just for that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's fucking biblical. It's amazing. I thought Saki Kashima was fantastic throughout it, just pinning people with a Kishikasai, which is the most over finisher in stardom. It's the most protected. That's what I meant, most protected finisher in stardom. No, apart from one person who kicked out, and I can't remember who it was. Um... <laughs> That shit, that shit pinned Julia for the first time. Oh, it was Mayu. Mayu kicked out, and then she rolled Mayu up with one anyway, literally 30 seconds later. Um, but, yeah. I mean, the the initial set of eliminations, you know, doesn't particularly matter. I um, thought it was interesting that Konami was one of the first ones eliminated, but there we are. It doesn't matter. Um, but, yeah, that final stretch of Starlight Kid taking on Saki... And Tora, and as soon as you got down to Tora and Starlight, you're like, they're not going to put a we, they're not going to put Tora in stars, they're just not. And it was I mean, something that we made decisions on. We did make dumber decisions on this card. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! I know you're talking about the main event, and I, I just don't want to get into it with you yet. Um, it was something that both of us talked about when they did this in Yokohama about Starlight joining a Wee tie. And how that would contribute to Starlight's growth. Um, and what a heel Starlight Kid is going to be. Is she still going to be known as Starlight Kid in a Weeder type? It doesn't really sound like an a Weeder type, type name. Is she just going to default like Fuking and Death did, where she was initially like, oh, I don't want to be in this. And then apparently now she does. Um, I mean, I think more of Death is it's like, so they just, so Clockwork Orange there. Like they. Had, they widened her eyes and like showed her videos of the pixies or something. <laughs> <laughs> just showed her all of the nineties grunge. Um, yeah, just, oh, just open her eyes and make her watch Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be. In- I know that they're gonna bully Starlight Kid, and obviously the first show 
after this. Um, I think it's the 19th of June. And that's when Mayu and Starlight will officially have to face off for the first time. So that'll be a really, really, really interesting dynamic. Um, Mayu is beside herself at the end of the match. Just There's a brilliant moment, actually, where just after the pinfall, Mayu's tied to the ring post and um, Starlight's just been beaten. And Starlight reaches out to Mayu and Mayu reaches out to Starlight and just before their fingers touch, Konami kicks Mayu's hand. And it's like, oh, it's just beautiful. Like, they don't even get that final touch. It's just great. It it, it was the best result that could have come out of this match for me. Because not only are we going to see a completely different side of Starlight Kid, but we are going to see a completely different side of Mayu Iwatani because Oida Tai are slowly but surely stripping Mayu of everything that she loved. Yeah, Stars, uh, be, oh, uh, Stars has lost basically everyone this last year. Tam left, Arisa retired, um, Jungle's injured. Yeah. So she's basically got one child and Koguma. Yeah, that's literally it. That's literally all yeah. Stars is at the it- moment. Maybe Rin will drop in every once in a while, but she he's she's like the cool uncle who brings you drugs or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> that maybe Aroha will come in to help or something. They can't do another one of these tags. We don't have the numbers. They already had to draft someone in. You know that there's going to be another one. You absolutely know there's going to be another one where stars are going to win. Who knows? Yeah, they seem to just don't want Mayo to overexert herself this year, so they're just forcing her to come with a word of tie. If you were booking this, Chris, and yeah. try to answer this sensibly without bringing in Nick Gage, um, okay. the final step of this, you've already had two matches where opposition have had to join the opposite unit. Is the next logical step one of the units dissolving? Yeah, probably. I can't think of any other way to take it. Um it would have to be like a three on three or something. Cause <laughs> otherwise you just can't do it. Unless I don't know, Queen's Quest and Stars merge or something like that. You know how like Chaos and Main Unit merge for a little while in mm-hmm. New Japan? Yeah. Um maybe May completely isolates everyone in her attempts to get Starlight back. That could be quite cool. Um, I don't know where they go from here, to be honest. Because the next question is obviously which unit dissolves. And oh, <laughs> Star- stars would be weird because it'd be like dissolving the main unit in New Japan. It's I'm, like I mean, they're okay. your main baby faces. Yeah, it's it. It would be weird. Um, I don't know. Maybe it could lead to the draft. Maybe we'll have a draft soon. I hope I, I miss the draft. It wouldn't surprise me, because either way, you're going to lose either your main baby faces or your main heels. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you've just spent, you know, the better part of six months trying to build up this heel faction, to then completely dissolve them would be very strange. Um, You know, and you've just had so many defections from stars, you know, Ruaka, Rina, um, Fukukin Death, um, and now Starlight's left. It it wouldn't surprise me if it's stars that dissolves, um, and then we do eventually get, you know, a draft of some description. It's going to be really interesting, the storyline going forward. You made an excellent point then about Mayu. What length is Mayu going to go to to get Starlight back? Didn't she say the same thing about Daph? She gave that up very quickly. She gave it up without literally a second thought. We literally like, could oh, not I, give a shit about the clown. It's like, oh yeah, um, she she made fun of my book last year. Fuck her. <laughs> That match was great. That match was really good. It's the only time I've found Go King Death funny. Um, well, Death Yamasan as she was then. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking forward to seeing the impact it has on Mayu's character. I'm very excited to see how this contributes to the evolution of Starlight Kid. Whether we do, you know, see the shedding of the Kid Monica, and you know, we end up with Sky Tiger. Starlight. Starlight adult. Scar- Starlight adolescent. Which sounds ding, like ding, the ding, worst ding, indie ding, band. Ding, 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 ding. It's just like a it's just a weird parody of um uh, Art and Monkeys. <laughs> uh yeah, and like you said, come the end of this, May vows to win Starlight back. The genuine emotion throughout it 
absolutely tremendous. In the words of the great Axel Rose, where do we go? Where do we go now? Um, you really didn't need to reference that. You could have just said, where do we go? That was so fast. Oh, on, it, wasn't. it wasn't. It wasn't. You are, you're better than this. It worked so well. Um, Apparently, you're not better than this. I should stop being disappointed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> more, the, the quicker you realize that I am only here to disappoint, then you, we will get along far better. Oh, I found that out in Blackpool, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what did you give this, Chris? Um, I gave it four just for the ending alone. That was fucking biblical. Yeah, I gave it three and three quarters. Um, the in-ring action can completely take or leave, but the fact that they actually pulled the trigger on separating Mayu and Starlight, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt on that. I think that's really, really good storytelling. So, yeah, brilliant. Um, we then got the aforementioned announcement of the Five Star Grand Prix, which will stretch from the 31st of July at Yokohama Budokan to September 25th at Ota Ward City Gym. Yeah, we've, we've somehow managed to make um, a 20-person round-robin more concise than a 16-person zig elimination. To be fair, it was pushed back a week for uh, the state of emergency. So. Yeah, but it was still going to take place over a fucking month. <laughs> Um, again, we'll get into more of that um, probably after the uh, Yokohama Budokan show on the 4th of July um, because we'll have a little bit more of an idea of the landscape and you know whether tiles have changed hands. Spoilers, not that I think they will. Um, moving on to the semi-main event then, and it was the Cinderella tournament final with Sayaka Matani defeating Micah at 15 minutes and 5 seconds with the Phoenix Splash. Chris, what do you think of this match? I like this. It was probably Sire's best Starlight Splash. Phoenix Splash? I don't know why I said Starlight Splash. Is it because you were thinking of the Stardust Press? <laughs> yeah, yes, I was. <laughs> I do agree. It was picture perfect. Yeah. Um, we already know these two work really well together, and they worked really well together on a big stage. It kind of follows. It does. It was um, a different we... match from Sire, though. I thought. Um, yeah. Like, there was actually, like, a blimp tag thing. <laughs> like, I didn't know she knew what legs were. No, and I think they went the right way about it in the fact that they'd had Sai Kamatani as the aggressor and Mike are the one selling. Yeah, because it's normally the other way around. Because, uh, you know, that always ends well. Uh, but yeah, because it was a flip of dynamic from what we're used to. Sai is better on top than she is from underneath, by the looks of it. Um, like she has great offense, but she can't sell worth a shit. So this is probably the best dynamic to play. Um, basically, it was just a really fun final, to be honest. Mm. Like, but in terms of in ring, it was just kind of good. But then the weight of it being a final turn, a uh, tournament final, kind of carried it. Um, as bad. As I think the format is with Cinderella this year, there's been a fair few good matches, and this is one of them. So, I agree. Um, Sai's targeting of the leg was fantastic in this match. Not only the targeting of the leg, but the fact that she adapted her offense to target the leg instead of just hitting drop kicks. She was drop kicking the leg. Um, she was wrapping the leg up in the ropes and then coming off the top turnbuckle to hit the leg and constantly just being relentless with it. And it wasn't like it was forgotten, you know, as we worked through the match. You know, we had the Micah power-up spot maybe halfway, three-quarters of the way through the match where you think even though Sai has done all this damage, she's still not going to be able to do the complete that final boss to be able to do, you know, to get to that final plinth at the top you know she's done all the work she's done the hard work she got to the Budokan and lost she you know is she going to then fall at the final hurdle here but no she does eventually manage not only just to polish Micah off she hits the star crusher and she goes for that move the phoenix splash which is great because it's a the move she pinned um I can't remember who she pinned when they won the tag titles um but she used that move um, she's only used it, I believe, three times, so it's not overexposed. She missed it at Budokan, didn't she, um, against Utami? Um, so it was it it put over how important this was to Saya. Um, is the right decision having Saya win, or at least for me it was? Um, I think once the brackets, once my initial 
um, choice for it, got eliminated in the first round by fucking Rina. Um, really convincingly as well. Oh, mate, just I'm still not over that. Um, I think Sai Kamatani was a good fit for the Cinderella, to be perfectly honest. Um, again, Mikey deserves credit because her selling was absolutely tremendous here. She was stumbling. She was um, struggling on the leg. Every move she was doing, she was holding the leg constantly, reminding us that Saya had done all this work on it. Saya was fucking relentless. She was so aggressive. She exploded out of the traps. And I love seeing that side of Saya. You know, that you know, not just going through the motions, doing the same moves. We actually had a game plan here and it worked really, really, really well. I gave it four stars. I thought it was a really, really, really tremendous match. I gave it three and three quarters. Yeah, well, we're basically on the same page, aren't we? Um, yeah. Um, apparently, Will Osprey retweeted the shooting star saying, awesome, which is weird. It's turning up on my Twitter. I don't follow him. <laughs> so, we're here. Um, I am going to warn you now, ladies and gentlemen, that there is probably going to be an argument between me and Chris. I can sense it and have sensed it since uh, since we started the call. So uh, just be wary. Um, I'm talking, of course, about the main event of the show, which was the World of Stardom well, Championship events. match. Yeah. Um, technically two main events. With Utami, the champion, uh, retaining over Suri after a double KO. 43 minutes and 19 seconds so Chris Mm -hmm. have at what's the fucking point of a time limit in a sporting contest if you're going to fucking ignore it what's the point the the, Utami and Shuri are two very good wrestlers I like watching them wrestle I liked the opening here. I thought the technical exchange, while it made it very obvious that they were working towards a draw, was very compelling. I thought the bombs they started throwing in the back half of the first of the first match were very good. I thought this was going to be a very good match coming out of it. I was satisfied with the draw. And then Shiri says, no, give me an extra half an hour. And they gave her an extra half an hour. No. Right, so okay, so it and then it went on for the extra 20 min, 23 minutes. The extra 23 minutes were really good. Yeah, who the fuck cares? So it was 13 minutes. 13, right. I, it was an extra 13 minutes to go to a draw anyway. So, you know, that extra 13 minutes really fucking meant a lot. The, <laughs> it, here's the thing. If this was, if you just watch this in a bubble and you don't watch Stardom, you have no intention of like following the promotion after this match, apart from for maybe big shows. But I'm sure, I can see how people can call it a match of the year. Like I saw Joseph Montesilla really liked it on Twitter, and he does. I know he doesn't really watch Stardom, so like that makes sense. A lot of the people in our Discord really like it. Um, I've seen a lot of people like it, but. It, it, this is just trivialized the point of having a time limit. Now, you had that time limit in place. It's been in place since the title's been there. And now anyone beforehand who didn't just ask for extra time looks stupid. Everyone who goes to a draw after this and doesn't ask for the extra time looks stupid. The amount of draws that Stardom do, there were like two in the lead up to this. The amount of draws they do on regular shows kind of diminishes the when a draw happens here. We discussed this a lot last year because we were really bad about it last year, where the only times I think draws are acceptable are either in a title match, in a tournament, or if it's a special singles between two really big wrestlers. So say like like in the example of Tam versus um, May earlier in the year, I'm fine about going to a draw, but they, they both need more than 15 minutes. So that's completely fine. But having how many basically every fucking DDM tag match it feels like go to a half hour draw really diminishes the impact of this draw and then they trivialize this draw anyway again in a bubble this is really good this is a very fucking good match like in a bubble pure in ring work top five stardom matches of the year I wouldn't feel out of place in saying like the only things being in it for me really are Starlight and Julia 
Utami and Saya and Yashiko May. They're the only things really beating that this match for me in terms of pure ring quality. But I say it a million times, I don't watch wrestling for the most part in a bubble. And this trivializes so much about stardom going forward. You done? I, I guess. I, I'll see what you have to say and then, you know, I'll explain why, why you're wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. So, we are agreed that pure in-ring work, this match was outstanding. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the spots in this match were horrendous to watch at times. Utami's air raid crash on the very corner of the apron I thought would be the worst bump. And then they decided to top that by Utami literally wheelbarrow suplexing Suri neck first onto the apron from the ringside. That was horrendous to watch. Um, Speaking about the two parts, I thought the fact that the 30-minute time limit draw was a completely different match to the 13 minutes that followed, I thought that was really good. You had two very distinct matches. You had your match that escalated from mat wrestling at the start, which was brilliant, the chain wrestling, the one-upmanship at the start to throwing huge bombs at the end. And then during the 13 minutes that then followed, you have got just both women going all out trying to end it because they know if they don't end it quickly, they aren't going to be able to carry on. And that was great. The fact that we didn't have a definitive winner works really well with the feud that they're having because you have got Suri, who has been in Utami's head this entire time. And there was bits on Twitter about how, you know, the kiss that Suri gave Utami was all, you know, it, it, awo- it awoken her. And, you know, we had all this. Suri playing mind games. And the fact that Suri couldn't put Utami away keeps Utami strong. Now, I know that the massive thing that you've got, the massive thing that you take issue with is the fact that there is a draw, and effectively there is overtime. No, no, but... but- the draw isn't the big issue. Again, it, it would be that the, the, uh, the draw made sense. I could see it coming a mile off when the match started. The overtime is my issue. Because imagine if that happened like an MMA fight. You go your five rounds and you go, no, 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 I won't be over rounds. No, fuck it. That's not the agreed upon fucking rules. But there, isn't, never been... there isn't draws in MMA. Y- yeah. So if, they want, if they wanted... If they want to find... If he went to an overtime and found, and went to a win, then you know, then I'd kind of get it. But I'd think the best way they do it is in um. You don't have have an overtime and MMA. That's my point. There shouldn't be overtime here. What's, why would you give it overtime? And then the fact they went to a draw anyway. The overtime in terms of storyline, I don't think really added anything. They, I think they still it did. couldn't finish. No, it didn't. Of they course, just, it they, did. Just... It put over both women as completely relentless while trivializing the title. How is that trivializing... not adding something to trivial... it? Whilst trivializing the rules of the title to the point that any gains gains there are completely trivialized. All like, sporting but... contests no. have overtime. No. Football, rugby. If you are in a yeah, cup that, competition, that it is, goes to an is, overtime. That is... That is in championship finals, and in championship finals in wrestling, like in the Five Star, like in the Cinderella, we don't have we don't have time limits for that specific reason. There's a first time for everything. It doesn't necessarily trivialize everything that came before it. No, because we'll probably never use use this again, and it's going to be this weird oddity, and it's just stupid. But you just it's calling even, it like stupid you, doesn't mean if you, that if using you want... this doesn't put both women over. It it does, but at the same time time it just makes every draw that's happened for for a belt and stardom before this absolutely laughable because they could have just the whole time went oh yes i'll just have that extra half an hour please thank you but again there has got to be a first time for something but, but there's got to be a first to, time for everything to, they didn't need to do do it here like what saying uh, there needs to be a first time for everything sure but like nah but this isn't a pa- this isn't something that had to be within because this isn't going to, with the exception of this specific feud, which still would have had the same p- reason for going forward with or without the overtime because we went to a draw anyway. 
I disagree. I think it puts both women over as powerful. I think it makes Shuri look hellbent on the but title. But trivialise every draw that's happened in But Saturday again, before. you're just repeating the same and point for any over draw... the top of everything I've said, even though the but, fact that I have, I have that's answered the fucking that problem. point. And that is just the fucking problem. No, because you are ignoring the fact that I have answered that point just to continue making the same point. The fact that it, in inverted commas, trivialises every draw beforehand, it doesn't. OK, it's the first time. And again, if you then think of progress, I'm not necessarily saying that this will happen again. It probably won't ever happen again. OK, which makes this match unique. The fact that you didn't and, like and that- it doesn't mean that it trivialises everything that came before it. It's like saying in football, well, they didn't have penalty shootouts. They used to do it. And a flip of a coin. Well, why didn't they just say, you know, the people that flipped the coin, why didn't they say, well, we should have had penalties then? Well, no, because it wasn't a concept that was... a at their disposal then. Just because it has happened here doesn't necessarily mean that everything that came before it is instantly lacking in credibility. For a start, for a start, Utami accepted that. She accepted the overtime. Siori wanted the overtime, Utami accepted. Who's to say that in every draw beforehand... The person, the challenger, would have asked for the draw and the champion would have gone, nah, you're all right, see you later. We don't know. Okay? There are different circumstances to every draw. Now, they're obviously not going to do this with the 15-minute time limit tag team draws on road two shows in front of 55 people. Because nobody gives a shit. Say again? Julia versus Shiri last year. Didn't the tag towers go through a draw recently? No. Did either people... Did either person ask for overtime? No. No, but it's not something that should be given to them because there's rules to this fucking sporting contest. Where, which, where in the rules it, does it say that it has to go to a draw? There have been other wrestling matches that have gone to a draw and have then had overtime. Stupid very no. So because you think it's stupid, the I've match is there for it, null and I've, void. I have explained why I think it's stupid, and I've explained that if you just look at this in a bubble, yes, it's completely fine. I don't watch wrestling in a bubble. But neither do I. So I don't understand how, just because... Okay, take the overtime out of it for a minute. So you're saying the fact that the the overtime then ended in a double knockout is the issue? That's part of the issue, yeah. Because the extra 13 minutes... It it is physically impressive. It, it like that's not my point here. It is very physically impressive, but the main point here is, oh, we want to move forward. We want to move forward with this feud of no one, with not no one getting a win, so this feud can continue. Yeah, sure. The thirty minute time limit achieved that just nicely. If they want to have do this with the title, they extend the time limit. And I'll do but an, then you'd an... bitch and moan about the fact that they extended the time limit. No, but they've, oh, they've they're just it making in... it like New Japan main events. Guarantee no, that you... will be the first thing out of your mouth. No, because honestly, honestly, if this was if it was just an hour long in, in, in New Japan, the problem is they do it over fucking time. They don't go this long over time in Stardom. The fact that this match goes long makes it unique in Stardom. Exactly. Have you seen so, but, the amount but, but, of the press same... that this match has got? You've got people from ESPN tweeting yeah, about but... it. When the fuck have people yeah, from ESPN ever talked about stardom? Cool, but I, I'm very happy this match got attention onto stardom. As it that rightly should have done. That doesn't mean I have to like what is done. I've laid out why I don't think... I am at no point like telling done. you that you have got to like it. I am not telling you you've got to like it. What I'm saying is that the reasons don't necessarily mean that everyone has to believe that the match is stupid or I'm that the ending was believe... stupid or that the draw was stupid I'm or that everything everyone coming to... before it which is trivialised. I do think it's tri- trivialised, though. Because now, in future matches, there's precedent set for this, which, pro- which as, as you yourself have said earlier in this argument, they're just going to ignore, because they just wanted this one match to feel special, and if they wanted something like that, they should have had this match go to a draw and then saying, we're going to have a special time limit. Because it's not like it's the first time we've had special time limits for championship matches. It wouldn't even be the first time we had a special time limit for a championship match in like any sort of wrestling. Look at Omega, Okada. No one can complain there, because it 
kind of just made sense. They could have just replicated that here instead of just throwing it on at the end of the throwing on what was a fairly superfluous 13 minutes after the end of what was already a really good match. But then when there are Iron Man matches that are a draw at the end of the time limit and that goes to overtime, why do you not complain pre- about that? One, when was the last time we covered a fucking Iron Man match? That's irrelevant. It still happens in Iron Man matches quite a lot. Well, I've never talked about an Iron Man match with you, so you don't know if I do like that. Do you like that? In Iron Man matches, it makes sense because you're going to like you're with it's with you have scores. At that point, it is like going to pe- to a penalty shootout. But this is like having a penalty shootout because no, effectively both women were nil nil. Neither of them had submitted to a pin. Neither of them had submitted to a submission. Yeah, but so how is that different? Because from the first fucking Iron Man match, that the person that has been to go to a draw, it goes to a, it goes to a sudden, it goes to sudden death. In reg- these regular championship matches, they've went to draws before. They've just fucking continued. They've just accepted it's a draw, move on. Maybe there'll be a rematch. But the fact that there is this is the inaugural one. This could be the first time where they've gone. Do you know what? Then We're going to change the rules. They sh- and they should have done it. At, done it when they had other time limit draws. So from the start now, of time, no, it's, no. But from the start, of fucking you lay out your fucking rules and you stick to your rules. These things are set in stone. How dare you change? Is what you're saying. No, but you don't change it on the fly at the end of of a show. I'm not necessarily saying they're changing it on you, the fly. You, you make you make a ruling afterwards. You don't change. They did because they did change it on the fly. We're just like, I want an extra fifteen minutes. Goes to Rossi. Rossi just goes, yeah, sure, what the fuck ever. Whose company is it? I don't give a fuck whose it's company Rossi. it is. Well, you should do for a start. That's a really petulant thing to say. It's Rossi's well, company. Okay. Ultimately, if they ask Rossi. Can we go another half an hour? And they say, do you know what? Yes, you can. Who... Can you play outside for an extra 20 minutes, please? Say again, I missed that. Teacher, can you play outside for an extra 20 minutes, please? Can we have 20 minutes at the end of lunch break, please? Have you been good? Yes. Go on, then. She hasn't been good. She's been caving people's heads in. How many times did she do it? <laughs> Because, you know, if it's less than three, then that's an improvement. So, yeah, fucking go at it. Look, Gold star, buddy. <laughs> take, tell you what, you've taken the time off golden time, have it back. <laughs> Do you have golden time up in Scotland? Um, We did when I was in Scotland. I, honestly, I can tell you what school's like in Scotland because I haven't been in school for fucking, what? My girlfriend does golden years. time and I've, I've, I've never had it and I've never taught in a school where it's been a thing. Ever. I mean, like, it's nice to have, to give people a treat at the end of a hard week <laughs> um look we're, we're never going to agree on this match i think i think that's safe to say from the fact that we've basically just sworn at each other so let's agree to disagree let's let's talk taking the time limits out of it for a second because i know for a fact that neither of us are going to agree on our rating either so it, it's pointless the match itself both women deserve enormous credit for what they put themselves through in this 43 minutes. Yeah, I've had two very good wrestlers. I like watching them wrestle. I think together they had tremendous chemistry. And I think there were spots in this. I think the match escalated beautifully. And if there is a rematch, which, let's face it, there is going to be, then I am all here for that. Um, I think I saw something, and I think it might have been on Dragon Moon's Twitter, actually, where... They did an interview, I think it was Shupro did an interview with Utami, and they asked her about the fact that the Red Belt hadn't um, main evented these shows. And we, I hadn't really thought about how it must be impacting Utami, because when we spoke about it on the podcast, we were all like, well, the prestige of the Red Belt, it must headline, and, you know, irrelevant of who holds it. And apparently, it, it really got to Utami. It, like, it really, really, really upset her. Well, it would, a fucking tag title match about that stardom just don't actually care about headlined over it just because they wanted Julia in the main event. Completely agreed. Completely agreed. There was absolutely no way that that should have main evented. And 
she just said, like, you know, if it was May who's still holding this belt, then it would be main eventing. And you look at it and go, yeah, she's probably right there, actually. And then she said towards the end of the interview that, do you know what? I'm just going to keep having great matches and hopefully people will recognize it. And basically what I'm going to ask you, Chris, I saw someone saying that this is one of the best Red Belt Reigns ever. Um, and you look at the matches that she's had. They haven't exactly given her... You look at who Yutami's had so far in this reign. She's had Micah. She's had Sayaka Matani. She's had Suri. She's had um, B Priestley. She's had Super Rookies and B Priestley, basically. And and Suri. And Suri. And, and you look at them... And Utami has put on fantastic... And, and I know that we are not in agreement regarding the Mica match. I liked it a lot more than you did, but you still said it was a good match. It's good. Utami has been able to pull together these fantastic matches, and with every match, she seems to be getting better. Mm-hmm. It's an extremely solid reign. Extremely especially, solid. Especially for your first reign. You don't normally get, have a really good reign on your first time round. I don't... Yeah, and... On top of that, you are following Mayu's reign, which we we wax lyrical about yeah, how was, good Mayu's was reign a, was. There was not a sub three and three quarter star match in that reign. Agreed. She she had an outstanding reign, but not only is Utami following the icon of stardom with the red belt, but she's also following what was a fantastic reign with that red belt that had, you know, match of the year after match of the year after match of the year. And you think, is Utami, who, you know, has been wrestling for, what, two and a half years, maybe? Mm. Is she going to be able to follow this? And, yeah, she's knocking it out of the fucking park. She's a very different kind of wrestler now, because she's a, well, a powerhouse. So they're very different kind of brains. A lot of male Agreed. dream was spent um, working from beneath, whereas Utami's normally on top. Yeah. Yeah, agreed, because Utami, like you said, powerhouse. You know, you think about a match with Mike, it was a very bomb-heavy match, um, whereas Mayu spent the majority of her reign just being beaten the piss out of. Mm-hmm. Um, which, don't get me wrong, like, was we, entertaining. We, we've also forgotten her Momo match, which was also outstanding. Of course. that was the. I knew there was another one. <laughs> I couldn't remember what it was. We were just thinking of the ones this year, and we forgot about the one last year. Exactly, because that was it. Um, Osaka Dream, That's wasn't it? it? Of course. Yeah. Um, I knew there was five because they said this was a fifth title defense and I couldn't remember who the fifth one was. But no, that was an exceptional match as well. So, you know, she hasn't had a miss yet. I say that um, post-match, um, Natsu Katora comes out holding Starlight Kid's mask, which is excellent heel heat, um, and basically challenges Utami for the red belt. Um, I think we've known that Atora challenge for the red belt has been coming for a while um how pardon me sorry i've got hiccups how do you feel about tora as a red belt challenger she's the leader of a well time she has a decent record and like on paper it's completely fine as long um we saw from the five star last year that utami and tora have good chemistry mm. um that was only ruined because tora was obsessed with chains at that time um s and m tora yeah it's as long as it doesn't turn into the bollocks that was for Julia match, it should be fine. Yeah, if it's if it's a normal one on one match, I think it will be fine. If there is some weird shit stipulation, if this becomes a death match, then that's time to be concerned. Um but ultimately, you know, we knew this was going to happen. I think Utami will get a good match out of Tora because when Tora is motivated, I mean, a couple of matches that come to mind. You mentioned the Utami match in the five-star. Um, her and Saki had a great match against Momo AZ in the Tag League. That was a really good match. And she's had the odd good match. Um, obviously, she's never challenged for the Red Belt, I don't think. So, you know, what other motivation is there? Um, I don't see Tora winning it, to be perfectly honest. But we'll uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. After this match, um, I, I did mean to say, actually, um, Suri did say before that um, she was going to dedicate this match to the memory of a late mother who she lost, um, I think, partway through last year. I think that was the reason she missed a couple of five-star dates, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. Um, so, obviously, thoughts are with Suri. Um, post-match, we had the Cinderella um, sort of presentation. Um, Sa- Saya Kamatani came down, green dress... 
the trophy, which I think was a new trophy this year. Um, the tiara, she looked fantastic. All the pyro and everything. It was a really, really good moment. Um, she did call out Tam for a white belt shot. Um, and, you know, there's the whole storyline embedded that Tam, as I've said before, was Saya's trainer. So that is now a match as well. And that was the end of the show. Um, are you excited for Saya versus Tam Chris? And secondly, as we're talking about this, do you think Saya beats Tam for the white belt? Um, I think no, no, I don't think so. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that the Cinderella has set up another white belt defense because it's basically just a white belt tournament now. Um, do you think they've but... done that, Chris, because the five star leads to the red belt? Maybe, but at that point, just make it officially for the white belt because I think at that point, that yeah. would just make the white belt look better. I don't know. Um, yeah, all right. I, I, I don't, I don't, m- maybe if they do use the last, what, three winners have went on to win the white belt? The last one was, I believe, Tony Storm who went for the red belt. Yeah, but the, the ones who have challenged for the white belt all got the white belt. They've all won it. Yeah, so I think they might buck the trend here because Tam's not really had a reign yet. She's had one match. <laughs> yeah. Because for problems with Sardom, um, they're, used, they're very much used to padding out their at least in from 2019 backwards, they were used to padding out their cards with um, outside talent, which they can't really do right now. So most of the talent who'd normally be gone for, who could go for the white belt are tied up with the red belt, basically. Hmm. So who knows? It could be a cool thing for Queen's Quest, um, where Momo's the only one of our belt. <laughs> Bury Momo. <laughs> yeah, let, let's continue burying Momo. <laughs> Um, I don't think Sai wins either. Um, uh, basically, for the same reason as you. Um, so you know, Julie won the white belt, Risa won the white belt, Momo won the white belt. So it is, it is about time that we had someone that didn't. Um, I think, I think there'll be a fantastic match. I think if anyone is capable of putting on a fantastic match, Sai Kamatani's proved that she can, and we know Tam is fantastic. So I have very high expectations of that match. Um, you mentioned Tam's title run at some deviant on Twitter has just asked, have they dropped the ball on Tam's white belt run to date? It feels like they haven't made it a really important run. Um, what's your opinion on that? Um, I don't think it's met the hype that, ha- that was that surrounded it when she won it. I don't think they, cause it, it happened at one of Stardom's biggest shows ever. Hmm. So I, I think it's impossible to match that height. But, you know, in terms of that, but you tell me they couldn't find a white belt challenger in, with anyone in that um, elimination. No, in that um, six-way. In, like in the three-way attack, you're telling me that, that Momo was in a good fill of defense. You're telling me that. Um, and that's probably rematch with Julie rematch. I guess we don't want to burn the Julie rematch. But... I know Tam and Momo would have been a decent one. Tam and Azumi would have been a decent one. That was what and I was thinking. Na- and then Natsupoi would have been free to... Actually, no, she wouldn't really have been free, would she? Because no high-speed person's really left. But, like, I think we just did it because we wanted more of a thread in the match with Julia. Like, literally, I think that's it. I think they started um, see Julia as, like, the future... Uh, like, not even the future. I think we just see her as their biggest star. Mm. So it's certainly a favourite of the bookers right now. And yeah. I, I don't know, I, I don't know because I get you already have the Cinderella tournament, but that, the Cinderella tournament was full of rookies. So mm. I, th- I know, I ju- in terms of the start of the reign, yeah, they've definitely not, because they basically had a match with Natsupoy and when she's not really had agency in any of her feuds since. Hard to disagree with you, to be fair. Um, she had one defense. I think it was more. Uh, it seemingly at the moment, anyway, it seemed like it was more about the chase than the actual goal, wasn't it? Um, I, I, I I hate that because normally that's just because we get the belt on them and then forget how to book a baby face. Yeah, because like, they they'd started going full on heel with Julia, hadn't they? Like full on yeah, dickhead they, heel. They they talk about like when people talk about 
um, people being better at chasing with me out of the belt, they always seem to put the blame on the um, wrestler. Like, um, because that's the, it's been the discourse I've been most involved with over the last few years. You, you saw it with Juice Robinson. You just saw it with Naito. Mm. Where they're like, they're better chasers than the other challenges. That's not on them. They're still as good as they ever fucking were. It's just the bookers have forgotten how to book them. Inherently, and, people uh, have always been better at booking yeah. heels than faces. Yeah, and then you look at the rest of his cat, and uh, most challenges Tam maybe could have had were either tied up in the elimination tag in the Cinderella. But again, that being said, Momo is still a good challenge. Absolutely. As Azumi would have still been a good challenge, and that's the point rematch would have still been a good challenge because people were looking for that. Mm. So there was options there. We just didn't want Julia to have nothing to do because Julia was at the center of this freeway. Because quite honestly, at that point, Julia looks stupid because quite frankly, she has the clout to go, I want a white belt match and maybe she have gotten one. Yeah. I so, mean, there was only seven matches on this card, and one of them was a yeah. dark match, which we didn't even see. I haven't even mentioned that Rena defeated Hina and Lady C in the dark match. So, yeah. are you, you know, six and the, matches. And honestly, that, we... that elimination match, like some of these matches could have used a bit less time and all. Yeah, that, the, the elimination match went nearly 13 minutes. You're telling me it couldn't have been eight? You know, the elimination yeah. tag was 17. With You know, that could have been whittled down. I don't no, particularly think, think Micah think, and Yunagi needed you... eight minutes. You could literally, what you could literally do is take five minutes of the elimination tag and the 12 minutes of this, book something for Julia, book something for Tam for the white belt. Like, can, everything could have been fine. Ju- Julia's a big sound, but she doesn't need to be in a feature. Like, cause they, they try to make this match fairly featured. And, like, if they really wanted ju- to do something with Julia, she could have destroyed Mina. Because she'd look strong, and because she has nothing to do, it would just help her continue. And then maybe assuming that, like, with the wrestlers they had free on this card, they could have done a lot more. Hmm. Like, because I've honestly, I think part of the reason they went for the extra time with Utami versus Shiri is because they felt this card was Lacking. a bit weak. And honestly, with the, like, the Cinderella tournament takes up a total of what, half, half hour? Beyond the Cinderella and the title match, this card kind of was. We kind of needed a bit extra. It needed another title match, didn't it? Yeah. Um, like, because you can back to the record about how the Cinderella tournament um, is as prestigious as any belt. But that's because it's normally the self contained thing. As this drawn out thing, it's something that I think a lot of people, when a Cinderella match wasn't happening, forgot was happening. That's something that I acknowledge. I, I do. <sighs> especially with the amount of dates that Stardom run in between these shows, I do understand that that's going to be an issue. Because um, I I genuinely, until Stuart ran through who people like Sire, had, I completely forgot that Sire and um, mm-hmm. Starlight Kid had but had a people, um, Cinderella fan, uh, tournament match. People's path through the Cinderella feels a lot more impressive when it's in a short state. Mm. Like, honestly, I didn't f- fine, don't have it be one day, have it be two days, have for 16... 16- person tournament have round one be one day and then have a regular Cinderella the next day I'll have like a weekend at Kurrigan because Stardom's at the point where they could probably pull that yeah you're right and we'll we'll leave it on this point you're right it was it was a very top heavy card I mean from my personal standing I mean we gave the elimination tag between three and three quarters and four um, the Cinderella tournament match final match I think did you give three and three quarters and I gave four yeah um and then the World of Stardom title match, I gave four and three quarters. I know you didn't rate it, but I you know it. it's 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 a very top heavy card. But then you know you've got like say six people tied up in that three way tag match that didn't really need to be tied up in that three way tag match. <laughs> Cause, so because because time doesn't time works best in ten minutes. So give her a ten minute match with Momo. Tell me that woman just blitz everyone out of the place. Just give her a ten minute match against Azumi. I mean, and then make yeah. it a five way between Julia, Mina, and and everyone else. Just make it a five way. Yeah, or have um, well, like honestly, I think the best way you could have done it is Momo versus Tam, and then Julia and no, actually, yeah, Natsupoi versus Azumi and one of the Queen's Quest kids. Mm. Like and then you can have that open, have Julia look really fucking strong, um, have but also have Azumi pin that to point to set up a future rematch. Yeah. 
Like, I don't know. There's better, there were better ways to do to use for six women they didn't use. Yeah, and like it wouldn't, and it wouldn't be a case of burning a match because they're not gonna. Ha- we weren't gonna have Momo take on Tam for the white belt any other fucking time. So, no. All in all, it's it's a solid card it's with I, I, three matches. I actively encourage you to go and watch, especially the main event for me and the Cinderella tournament final. But for emotion, go and watch the elimination match as well. Um, the others are fine. There's no there's no inherently bad matches on the card whatsoever. But you know, it it might have benefited from another title match, like me and Chris were saying. Um, I think the closest um, I can compare this to is Set and Die Cinderella. Where like the mains like the mains like an objectively really good match. Yeah. The sem and um, then the semi is really good and then everything else is just kind of a just a bit forgettable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like with, the except, with the exception because we're gonna revisit this fucking debate as soon as we get to the year end awards. But like with the exception of the top match, nothing else is gonna be remembered this year. No. And you know <laughs> This match, um, Utami and Suri, for better for worse, you know, I know that you're down on certain areas of it, and that, that's fine. You are in, completely entitled to your opinion. Um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, never has forty three minutes ever seemed so quick. Um, but you go through Twitter, you go through Facebook, and there are people like John Pollock from Post Wrestling. I know he does. Um, post pro res with uh, wh park um but he very very rarely if ever talks about stardom he rated that he loved this match um filthy tom lawler um said go out of your way to watch this match dave Meltzer has said it's one of his matches of the year uh, brian alvarez there was someone from espn whose name I, I cannot for the life of me remember you think about the buzz around stardom and around this match in particular, you know, they've got to have been doing something right. You know, you know what I feel like right now? What do you feel like, buddy? You know those New, you know the New Japan people who didn't like how Kenny Omega wrestled, so felt really lost when peop- when an influx of people came in from uh, the Kenny Okada matches? Sort of. I kind of feel like that. <laughs> and like, I, I'm not a Krimogini old like I'm not a traditionalist by any sense because I think Nick Gage should wrestle in stardom. But um I don't know, I just think there's better ways to do what they did. If, if that honestly if that match didn't have a gap, I'd probably be in agreement with everyone else. Mm. I'm 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 not gonna argue. I think we we both said a piece. I'm you know, I imagine once we do get to end of year award season, um this match will be up there and for me rightly so. Um Someone, I think it was Redleaf um, on Twitter, um, who does a great podcast. Go and check them out. Um, they said Meltzer's said it's the best starter match he's ever seen, which leaves it as basically a four and three quarter or five star match. And yeah, I don't I think know, he's rated anything higher than four and a half. But I, I, I know this because every time, he, and I know this because every time he rates something, you bring it up on the podcast. I do, I do research. What can I say? Um, and you know, but no matter how Meltzer research really needed anyway no matter how arbitrary you know Meltzer's ratings are and how subjective they are and how you know you might disagree with them um i know i disagree with a lot of Meltzer's um, oh, ratings the match is definitely going to bring in a lot of people it's not just that chris but to have the accolade of being stardom's first ever five star match and i'm not necessarily saying it will get five stars but to have it as you know the highest rated stardom it's match a, by dave Meltzer, you know it's it, it's, it's, it's a great stamp to have exactly exactly and if it brings in more eyes to the product surely that's a good yeah. thing that's yeah I just ultimately hope, what that's ultimately just, what stardom needs yeah i just hope that eyes doesn't like change how stardom do things because we sort of felt as Stardom have got more popular, because they've got really popular, like more popular than we were over the last year. Oh yeah, can, even as we've been doing this podcast, you can you can feel them change, and like some areas of change are good. Like I think expanding the um, five star field size could be good. I don't necessarily think I think we should go back down to fifteen minutes. I think we both agree that's something we need to do. Mm. Um, but that's what sometimes it feels. It's, it feels like. Um, they because 
you see this with a lot of things in wrestling where think something will get popular and they'll start to indulge in the worst elements of what made it popular. You know, that's what new that's like I know you made the joke because like New Japan, that's what New Japan did, that's what NXT did, that's what it, before its recent um renaissance, that's what Ring of Honor did. Mm. Like it's just something wrestling does. It doesn't understand what gets it popular and follows what they think makes it popular. Yeah. Could WWE did the same thing. Like, you don't want some the popularity to ultimately lead to the demise or the you know people tuning out of the product. Basically, yeah, I don't want I don't want to have to make I don't want to ha- have to say goodbye to it because I don't want to, basically I don't want to start into become pres- um, prestige wrestling. But I think that's where I'm going with this. No, I I understand that, and I I knew sort of that that was where you were going with it. Um, the fact that you basically didn't want it to go the same way you feel about New Japan. Um, I know that we made the joke about the time limits and things like that, but even so, I, I do honestly, understand. If they went, because I don't, if they went up to a sixty-minute time limit, I wouldn't mind. That. Like if they use, if they did this and then use the next match as a sixty-minute time limit, went back long and just said, "Fine, we'll do a sixty-minute time limit." As long as they didn't go to the, go use that as an excuse to go forty minutes every match, I wouldn't mind. Right, let's call it there, Chris. Um, we'll be back at some point in the near future. Um, the next big stardom show um, is actually the um, Yokohama Budokan show. There we go. Uh, Yokohama Dream Cinderella 2021 in summer for July 4th. And the three matches that have been announced for that, um, two matches we've already talked about, the World of Stardom title match between Utami and Natsukatora, the Wonder of Stardom title match between Tam and Sayakamatani, and then the finals of the Future of Stardom Championship tournament between Mina and Yunagi, which obviously should have an interesting dynamic with them both being members both of Cosmic defense. Angels. Both very good defensive, both not good offensive. Let's just watch them like do the <laughs> fucking Anoki on his back against Ali thing. <laughs> both sit in the corner on their backs like turtles. <laughs> just yeah, no, they both, they both just road dog it. They're just <laughs> hanging on for the whole that. time. It's just that like it goes to a, it just goes to a draw and then it goes to overtime and goes to an extra half an hour. It's gonna be the fucking um, and then people are gonna call it a masterpiece because they stood and stared at each other and that's just what people like now. Apparently, I forgot how much you liked that. <laughs> um, but we will be back um to do a preview of the card before that show. Um, hopefully it will be on um Samurai. Fingers crossed they fixed I, the way of actually getting on to oh, Samurai. Um, I, I, I'm, I've been sent another way to get it, so you, you're fine. Fantastic. Well, we'll make sure we do that. Um, there is a Corican that immediately follows the show on the 4th. Um, there's one on the 6th. So what we might do, Stardom World depending, is we might do a preview before the 4th of July, and we might then do sort of a together one where we do... Um, Yokohama Dream and the Corican show depends entirely on scheduling. We might do too. I don't know. It depends. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate it. Please throw us a five star review if you think we've earned it on iTunes or wherever you're getting your podcast. It helps just a little bit of the exposure of the podcast. Um, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, don't forget to check out the website, www.podmania.co.uk. Um, you can find all our archived episodes as well as our match ratings for the shows and the shows that we've done today. Um, if you think we've earned it, you can always throw some money our way via coffee. Um, the link is in the podcast description. Don't feel under any pressure. Obviously, you can also buy our merch. That is also in the podcast description. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, it's at the Stardom Cash. Join our Discord, um, where you will be welcomed with open arms by people who know a damn sight more about Joshi than me. Um, you can talk to me on Twitter. It's at Real Rob Goodwin. Chris, where can they find you? At Adam Sandler. Why Adam Sandler? I don't know. Why, why Adam Sandler? Like, there's usually a link to something, but why Adam Sandler? I, I just really hope someone tweets Adam Sandler and he's like, "What the fuck is an Azumi?" <laughs> Yeah, direct any criticism of the podcast to at Adam Sandler. Uh, Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we will talk to you guys again soon. Bye.